Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. And today we're continuing on this series of talks about abelian varieties and curves, uh, reduction and complex multiplication. And today we're very happy to have Ananth Shankar talking about Picard ranks of K3 surfaces and the Hecke orbit conjecture. And Ananth, is it all right for us to video this talk? Yes, absolutely. Oh, great. Well, please go ahead. All right. So uh, first of all, thanks so much to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak at this wonderful seminar. And um, yeah, so, my so I'm going to be talking about Picard ranks of K3 surfaces and Hecke orbit conjecture. And everything I talk about is joint work with Devish Malik, Arul Shankar, Yunching Tang, and Salim Tayu. All right, so let me get started. So let me start off with um, the following broad question, which is, given a random complex abelian surface, and I'm using the word random extremely loosely, How likely is it to be a product of elliptic curves? Because of course, if you have a pair of elliptic curves, then that's going to be a complex abelian surface. And the question is, are such products are they most abelian surfaces? Are they, or are there few abelian surfaces um, a product of elliptic curves? So, here's a way to see that the answer is um, it, that it's extremely unlikely that a random abelian surface is a product. And here's a way to see this. So if you were to look at the moduli space of um, abelian surfaces, and I, should, and I should use the word principally polarized to be precise. So if you look at, so there's a, there's a space that parameterizes abelian surfaces. And the space is three-dimensional. Um, and if you were to look at the sublocus, which corresponds to abelian surfaces that, that are a product of elliptic curves, that's going to be a two-dimensional sub-variety of this space. Well, if you have a three-dimensional complex variety and if you have a, a two-dimensional sub-variety, then a random point is extremely likely to not lie on this two-dimensional sub-variety. Now it's possible to ask a slightly finer question. And instead of asking for a random abelian surface to be isomorphic to a product of elliptic curves, well, what about isogenous? So now instead of just one two-dimensional sub-variety of the three-dimensional space, you could take any point that's isomorphic to E1 cross E2, and you could, you could mod it out by some finite subgroup. You could take the quotient of this, um, of this product by a finite subgroup, and you get a different abelian surface, <clears throat> no longer isomorphic to a product, but it's, but it's said to be isogenous to a product. And you could look at the locus of such points. And depending on uh, what this, depending on the shape of the subgroup that you mod out by, this locus will be a bunch of different um, two-dimensional sub loci, but it's still going to be a countable union.
And this is going to be a countable union of two dimensional sub varieties of this ambient three dimensional parameter space. And so this locus has measure zero. And that's why it's still extremely unlikely that a random abelian surface is even isogenous to a product of elliptic curves. All right. So in the 1800s, Green studied an extremely uh, natural question that arises out of this setup. And what Green did was he studied this question in families. Namely, not if, not if you just have one single abelian surface, but if you have a family of abelian surfaces, then what can be said? And here's what, in fact, Green had to say. So if you have a holomorphic one parameter family of abelian surfaces, And when I say D, I mean uh, the complex unit disk. Then what Green proved is that the set of X so that the associated abelian surface is isogenous to a product of elliptic curves though it has measure zero is actually going to be infinite and now it is infinite it's going to be dense in d so in other words what green shows is that even though you have this behavior that's extremely rare if you look at it in families it still happens quite often even though the generic behavior is you know far from even though this behavior is far from generic so what i want to talk about at least what i want to start off by start off with today is to talk about arithmetic analogs of this theorem of green So, um, well, so I just talked about a holomorphic one parameter family. Now, what does it mean to have a, uh, to have an arithmetic family? So let me just sort of say a few words about what this means. So if you were to start off with an elliptic curve over Q, uh, it's going to be cut out by an equation of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And you can assume that a and b are actually integers. Now the idea is to view the primes of the ring z as, as a base. 
So the primes of the ring Z is supposed to take, supposed to play the role of, you know, your um, uh, open, open disk. And what you can do is for every prime, you can take the equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and you can reduce it mod that prime. And if you reduce it mod two, you're gonna get some curve uh, over F2. If you reduce it mod three, you're gonna get some curve over F3. You can reduce it mod five, you get a curve over F5. You can reduce mod seven, you get another curve over F7, so on and so forth. So by just taking this um, elliptic curve defined over Q, you can reduce it mod primes to get a family of elliptic curves, or you can to get a family of curves over every uh, FP as P varies over every prime number. Well, now this is a family and it makes sense to study this family. In fact, one of, and in one of the past talks, uh, Elkies talked about his um, seminal work where, where he proves that if you start off with any elliptic curve over Q and you study all these fibers, then infinitely many of these fibers are going to be super singular. Right? Now, um, this is one type of arithmetic family. Another type of arithmetic family is to replace Q by a characteristic P function field. Which is going to correspond to a curve over some finite field. Let me just say FP bar for simplicity. So K of C is going to denote the function field of, of C and um, a characteristic P family is just going to be a family of an algebraic family of um, abelian surfaces over C. Equivalently, an algebraic family of abelian surfaces over K of C. And again, points of C are going to be the same as primes of K of C. Let me say play a place of K of C. And you can um, take the fiber of A at the point X. In other words, reduce A mod V. And by varying your point, you again get a family of abelian surfaces and characteristic P. All right, so what one can do is one can start off with an arithmetic family of abelian surfaces and ask what happens to the fibers and ask how often the fibers are isogenous to products of elliptic curves, if at all. So it's a uh, wonderful theorem of, let me attribute it to, um, Chavdarov, Zvina, and Murthy Patankar, they all develop a framework which uh, talks about starting off with an abelian surface over a global field and asking for when it breaks up into a product of smaller abelian varieties. So if you have K, a global field, so it can either be a number field or a function field, and if you have an abelian variety, or let me just talk about the case of surfaces. If you have an abelian surface over such a field, and let's say that it has a commutative endomorphism ring, what they prove is that the fibers of this family are going to be simple. for a density one set of, a set of primes. All 
All right. So, so roughly speaking, okay. So exactly what they prove is that if you start off with an abelian surface over over a number field or a function field, you can reduce it mod every single prime of this um, number of function field, and you get a bunch of abelian surfaces defined over various different finite fields. Now, some of them are going to be isogenous to product of, isogenous to products of elliptic curves. Some of them are just going to be simple. And um, what they show is that most such abelian surfaces will end up being simple and therefore will not be isogenous to a product of elliptic curves. So that is um, what they prove. And what, what we do is we study the thin exceptional set of places where A mod V is finite. Sorry, is, um, is isogenous to a product of elliptic curves. So what about the set of places, which is necessarily going to be density zero, where A mod V is isogenous to a product of elliptic curves. So one very interesting thing that happens in the arithmetic case is that the set could be finite. So there exists a curve defined over FP bar and a non isotrivial family of abelian surfaces over this curve. Such that if you take every point X and C and you look at the fiber of this family, then it's going to be simple for all but finitely many points of C. Now, here's a way to see this. If you were to look at the moduli space of abelian surfaces that admit endomorphisms by um, a real quadratic field, and, that, and uh, this is called a Hilbert modular surface, and if, it's, and if you choose your real quadratic field appropriately, and by appropriately, all I want is for the quadratic field to be split at P. So we take an appropriate Hilbert modular surface mod P. It's going to be a two-dimensional space. So this parameterizes certain abelian surfaces. It parameterizes abelian surfaces that have endomorphisms by you know, some uh, real quadratic field. And then if you were to look at the non-ordinary locus, Just as in the case of elliptic curves, every abelian variety is either, there's like, you know, there's a bunch of different, um, the, the term is Newton stratifications. There's like a bunch of Newton polygons that an abelian um, variety mod P can have. In the case of elliptic curves, it's either ordinary or super singular. In, the, in higher dimensions, there are more choices. Um, and if you were to look at the non-ordinary locus in a Hilbert modular surface, then it's going to be one dimensional. And the only points in the non ordinary locus that parameterize abelian surfaces isogenous to a product are going to be super singular points. And the only non ordinary points that are isogenous to a product and are being super singular points. 
So if your one parameter family of abelian, abelian surfaces came from this example, then you only have finitely many uh, split, you, you only have finitely many points which are isogenous to a product of elliptic curves. So this um, behavior does not happen in characteristic zero. And so, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's some sort of, it's a warning that the arithmetic question is quite, is, is, is a lot harder than the geometric question over C. Because the same theorem doesn't even hold in complete generality. So as it turns out, this happens to be the only obstruction to um, Green's theorem not being true in characteristic, uh, Green's theorem not being true in the arithmetic setting. So here's what, here's what we prove. So this is joint with, um, so joint work with Arul Shankar, Yunching Tang and Salim Tayu, as well as joint work with Devesh Malik and Yunching Tang. Here's what we prove. So let K be a number field. And let A over K be an abelian surface that has potentially good reduction everywhere. Uh, this is not a very serious condition. Then we prove that the density zero set of primes So that A mod those primes is um, isogenous to a product of elliptic curves is infinite. And in the function field case, suppose you have an, if you have a curve over FP bar and you have a family of a billion surface over that curve. Which has potentially good reduction everywhere. And this condition isn't very serious again. And which is generically ordinary. And this is a serious condition because the theorem is false without it. Then the set of points in the curve so that your abelian surface so that the fiber over that point is isogenous to a product of elliptic curves is infinite. So in, so in both cases, we prove that um, a set of primes or set of points that's known to be extremely small and thin by work of um, Zawina et al is actually infinite. All right, um, now a similar question can be asked in higher dimensions. Now by high dimensions, I actually don't mean high dimensional abelian varieties, but I actually mean um, high dimensional moduli spaces and that ends up being considering this, considering not abelian surfaces, but K3 surfaces. And the fact that these moduli spaces are higher dimension, higher dimensional than the case of a billion surfaces makes everything a lot harder. So you can ask the following question, given a family of K3 surfaces, how does a Picard rank vary? as you vary your K3 surface in this family. 
And again, just like green showed in the case of abelian surfaces, green also proved that this holomorphic family, if you have a holomorphic family, the Picard rank should jump infinitely often, even though the set where it jumps is still going to be very thin. And again, it makes sense to ask this question in the arithmetic setting. And in joint work with um, Arul, Yunching, and Salim in the number field case, and with um, Devesh and Yunching in the function field case, we prove that similar behavior happens. So let K be a global field and let x over k be a k3 surface with potentially good reduction everywhere. And if the characteristic of the field is K, so if it is P, so if it's a function field, we also ask for X not to be isotrivial. And we need it to be generically ordinary because again, otherwise there are counterexamples. Then the Picard rank of x mod p is bigger than the Picard rank, is bigger than the generic Picard rank for infinitely many places. All right. So I think now might be a good time for me to pause to see if there's any questions. Oh, it sounds great. Please continue. All right. So the strategy of our proof builds on work of Chai Oort in characteristic P and Francois Charles in characteristic zero, or let's say in the number field case. So uh, the moduli spaces of abelian surfaces and also of K3 surfaces So the moduli space of abelian surfaces. and K3 surfaces are actually ortho are actually Shimura varieties and they end up being orthogonal Shimura varieties. So I'm not going to uh, define what these are, but um, rather I'll talk about properties that they have. So say you have an orthogonal Shimura variety 
it's you know just some um, it's just a variety it is a priori defined over the complex numbers but it admits extremely nice descents to um, to q the uh, to the field of rational numbers and not just that these moduli spaces also have extremely nice integral models over z um, and the wonderful thing about the fact that these Ashimura varieties associated to orthogonal groups is that they admit what are called, in fact, they admit a countable family. Of what are called special divisors. So it's just a family of divisors indexed by uh, loosely speaking indexed by the set of integers. And therefore that gives you a countable family of um, various divisors. And as it turns out, the, the points that lie in these on this countable family of divisors are precisely the points where your K3 surfaces, their Picard rank is bigger than the generic Picard rank. So let me just work, let me now, let me for now just talk about the function field case. So given a family of K3 surfaces over a curve where your curve is defined over FP bar, that gives you an embedding of your curve inside your Shimura variety. And what we need to do is we need to show that um, if you take your curve C and if you intersect it with this infinite union of divisors, you get infinitely many different points of C. Uh, the same thing happens even in the number field case, but then instead of talking about regular old intersection theory, you sort of need to talk about Arikulov intersection theory and that makes things, um, that adds an extra layer of complication to the number field case. So I'll um, mainly uh, describe this, describe, describe a strategy in the function field setting. So, well, how would you prove such a, such a result? The first input is so-called Bochard's theory. And uh, what that tells you is that as you vary this, as you take each special divisor, like z of one, z of two, z of three, so on and so forth. And as you intersect C with any individual one of these, it tells you how the intersection number grows. And in fact, the, the, amazing, the amazing fact is that uh, this intersection number as your number, as your n grows, it, these numbers um, are actually going to be the coefficients of a modular form. So you have a very good handle on how this number is growing. Now, if you could prove the following. Given a point on your curve. So if you were to intersect your curve with any special divisor, that's going to be a sum of local intersection multiplicities at all the points where C and that divisor intersect. So start off with a point um, on your curve and 
look at what that point contributes to the intersection multiplicity of C with your special divisor. All right. So if you could show that this local contribution is a little o has smaller order of magnitude as the global intersection number. Then as you vary over all special divisors, you can't just have say one point contributing to the intersection. You can't even have a fixed finite set of points contributing to the intersection at um, for every n because then the local intersection, the local contributions coming from that one point will, will, be, will eventually become smaller than the global intersection number. So if one could show the statement, then that would tell you that more and more points have to contribute to the intersection. as n varies, thereby giving you infinitude. All right, but well, as it turns out, the statement is actually not true. And this should make sense because we do know that there are counterexamples to our theorem being true. In fact, uh, if your curve was not generically ordinary, then there are, th then you know it is possible that your Picard rank does not jump or your Picard rank jumps only at finitely many points. And so that means that um, there has to be a finite set of points. There are examples where you can have a finite set of points in your curve where the local intersection from those points always make up the global intersection as you vary n as well. So this little o statement can't uniformly be true. So if you take a super singular point on, on your curve, if it parameterizes a super singular K3 surface, then it ends up happening that um, if you were to look at the local intersection multiplicity at this point of your curve intersected with your special divisor, then this has the same order of magnitude. As the global intersection number. And something reasonably similar, but not quite the same also happens in the number field case when you um, do things in the framework of auricular of intersection theory. So all of this is to illustrate that the arithmetic case is a lot, you know, is a lot hairier than um, the case of families of complex K3s. Nonetheless, if we assume C is generically ordinary, one can, we do prove that, we do prove the following statement. If you're given a finite set of points x1 up to xn on C, let me say x1 up to uh, xk on C, then for most numbers n, we have that if you sum the local intersection um, multiplicities over all these points, x1 through xk, then 
then it's going to be some fixed constant times the global intersection number. Where lambda is less than one. And of course, the order of quantifiers are important. Once you start out with, a, you first have to fix a finite set of points, and then the most n depends on the initial choice of points. And this is already enough to prove our main theorem. So I'm not going to say too much about how about what goes into the proof of this. Um, but one thing that ends up being extremely that that in fact flummoxed us for quite a while is that. Um, if you take a formal curve, then your global intersection numbers don't make that much sense, but your local intersection numbers do make sense. And let's say this point, this formal curve is uh, supported at um, the close point X, then the local intersection multiplicity of your formal curve with Z of N can grow arbitrarily rapidly. And so proving this theorem is necessarily going to be non-local. And one necessarily needs to use the fact that your curve C is actually an algebraic curve. So um, we use the algebraicity of our curve in a very crucial way to prove that our local intersection multiplicities are bounded. I should say that for small dimensions, specifically in the case of abelian surfaces, we don't need to, to, to bound these local intersection multiplicities. We don't really need to assume that our curve is algebraic. We're able to bound these local intersection mul multiplicities given a formal, given any formal curve even, as long as it's generically ordinary. But um, as, soon as, it, as soon as the dimensions of a modular space become bigger, it's no longer good enough to work with uh, formal curves. One actually has to use the algebraicity of, um, of the curve C in order to bound even these local intersection multiplicities. And I should just say that these local intersection multiplicities actually are, um, can be defined purely locally. So just given a formal curve, these numbers make sense. But we still need to use the fact that these numbers come from a global curve in order to bound them. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, and instead of talking any more about uh, Picard ranks of K3s or a splitting of abelian surfaces, I want to talk about um, a, a, a rather different problem. So take one of these orthogonal Shimura varieties. In fact, just take any old Shimura variety. These Shimura varieties, um, ed, these Shimura varieties come with a lot of extra structure, including what are called Hecker correspondences. And in fact, these uh, Hecker correspondences are quite intimately related to these special divisors that I talked about. If you were to take a special divisor and if you were to hit it by one of these Hecker correspondences, you get a different special divisor. And um, roughly speaking, these Hecker correspondences, if you take a point and you hit it with a Hecker operator, the set of points that you, that you get as an output will all be isogenous to the initial point you start off with. So these Hecker operators and correspondences also have really nice moduli interpretations. 
and it's been a it's been a question of great interest to study the distribution of the Hecke orbit of a point. And um, it's a beautiful theorem due to uh, Clausel, O oh, and he O oh, and uh, Ulmo, which says the following. If you start off with a complex valued point of Ishimura variety, then the Hecker orbit of your complex point equidistributes in the complex topology. So it fills out your um, Shimura variety. Well, what happens mod P? There have been various candidate notions of um, equidistribution mod P, uh, some of some of which are like you know varying levels of satisfactory as far as these definitions are concerned, but just the most basic question that can be asked is, is the Hecke orbit of a mod P point Zariski dense in the Shimura variety mod P? Because even if one is able to formulate an equidistribution statement mod P, for heck orbits to equidistribute, you, you first and foremost need your heck orbit to be Zariski dense in the first place. So it's an amazing theorem of a Chai who started this entire, who got this, you know, who got this conjecture um, started. That if your Shimura variety is the moduli space of abelian varieties, and if you have an ordinary point, and of course it's extremely crucial that your point is ordinary, otherwise the heck orbit cannot be dense in the Shimura variety mod P, then what Chai proves is that the heck orbit of X is Zariski dense. Um, Chai's proof is really beautiful. It uses lots of local and global techniques. But uh, one crucial input that Chai uses is that every point in AGFFP bar has every point in AGFFP bar has complex multiplication and therefore has real multiplication and therefore lies in a Hilbert modulus, a Hilbert modular variety, which is contained in AG. So in other words, what I prove is that if you have a point in AG of FV bar, it necessarily has to be contained in a positive dimensional, smaller Shimura variety. And then what um, Chai does is he proves the Heck orbit conjecture. I think this might also have been done, not just with Chai, but also with um, you, I'm not 100% sure. But then what they do is they prove the Heck orbit conjecture for Hilbert modular varieties, and that allows them um, to attack the case of AG uh, because if you were to take the point X and take its heck orbit and take the Zariski closure, this fact, along with the fact that they've already proved the heck orbit conjecture for Hilbert modular varieties, reduces to proving that the heck orbit of a Hilbert modular variety, not just a point, but a whole variety, is Zariski dense and that ends up being more tractable. All right, but um, like I said, this is an extremely crucial input in 
chi's proof. And this fact isn't going to be true for arbitrary Shimura varieties. So our main, uh, another one of our theorems and this joint with Devesh and Yunching is that um, if you, is that we prove the Hyakobert conjecture for orthogonal Shimura varieties. So let SH be an orthogonal Shimura variety and let P be a prime of good deduction for your Shimura variety. Then what we prove is that if you take a point that's ordinary, then its heck orbit is dense. Now, let me just end my talk with a brief sketch of how we prove this theorem. So the point is that um, these orthogonal Shimura varieties admit a countable family of special divisors. So I didn't really tell you what, what these were. I just told you that these parameterize K3 surfaces with an extra line bundle. But these Z of Ns, they are actually sub Shimura varieties, which are also orthogonal. So our method is to proceed by induction. So we start off with a point in our original Shimura variety. We take its Heka orbit. We want to prove that Z is everything. So um, it's easy to see that the Heka orbit of X has to be infinite and therefore Z is at least one dimensional. So Z contains a curve which is generically ordinary. And our theorem is our earlier theorem is that Z intersects the union of these special divisors at infinitely many points. And specifically at an ordinary point. Let's call it Y. For some fixed number and not. Well, now Y is going to be in a smaller orthogonal Shimura variety. And by induction, let's assume that we've proved the Heck orbit conjecture for the smaller Shimura variety. And so that means that um, the, Zariski, the Hecker orbit of Y is Zariski dense in Z of N naught. So Z contains the Hecker orbit of Y and therefore Z contains Z naught. Z contains Z of N naught. And so it's enough to show that the Hecker orbit of Z of N naught is infinite, um, is Zarsky dense in the ambient Shimura variety. And this is quite easy. And one can just see this by monodromy arguments.
So the point is that this theorem that we prove about K3 surfaces also allows us to prove a seemingly completely unrelated theorem, namely um, that if you were to start off with an ordinary point of an orthogonal Shimura variety, then its Hecke orbit must be dense in that orthogonal Shimura variety. All right, uh, let me stop now. Thank you so much for inviting me and for your attention.